the next paper continues on the line of correct by construction for something that's notoriously difficult to implement, let alone prove correct. And not only does it implement it, but it also makes it executable, and uh, especially in the case of crashes. So it's going to be very exciting to see what happens in the next talk. Nikolai Zeldovich from MIT will tell us all about it. Thanks, Petros. So I'm going to tell you guys about some of the work we've been doing at MIT on building a certified crash-safe file system. And I should say that a big amount of this work was actually done by the students, uh, Haogang, Daniel, and Tej, that uh, are, were involved in this project. So the problem we're trying to address is the fact that file systems are pretty complicated, and they have routinely uh, bugs discovered in them. So for example, this graph shows the number of bugs discovered in the ext3 widely used file system in Linux over the last decade. Now, the thing to note is that people continuously find more and more bugs. And even if we somehow manage to get ext3 to be bug-free, other file systems are being added to Linux all the time with their own bugs. And what's worse is that a number of these bugs are really serious. They lead to security exploits on computer systems, they lead to data being lost, and other undesirable problems. Now, of course, this has not escaped the notice of the systems community. People have been working on trying to deal with bugs for a long time now. A popular approach is to try to find and fix various bugs. And while very effective, this approach can't really prove the absence of bugs. It can greatly reduce their number, but we'll never have a confidence that there will be no more bugs to be find that found that can lose our data. And there's been some initial work done on trying to use formal methods to prove that a system will always behave correctly in the case of a file system, but none of them have a complete file system that I could actually run on my laptop or correctly handle all of the possible ways in which a file system could crash. And crashes are particularly important for a file system to handle correctly because they can occur at any moment. Because with power failures or my laptop runs out of battery or the hardware breaks or there's a bug in some other piece of software on my computer. And it's difficult to handle crashes because there's many possible partially updated in-flight states that you might be in if the computer loses power at an inopportune moment. So for example, on the right so side of the slide, you see a patch for a bug in the Linux ext3 file system. The patch is pretty simple. They just forgot to flush the journal contents to disk in a particular corner case. And the developers are saying, well, this is unlikely and this function doesn't get called very often, but if a crash happens at just the right instant, the on-disk journal can get lost and corrupted, and you might lose arbitrary data in your file system. So that's unfortunate, and to avoid these kinds of problems, our goal is to certify a complete file system. And what this means for us is to have a machine-checkable proof, very much like what Jay talked about, that the actual code running of a file system meets a formal specification of what we should expect from it. And we want this to be true not only during normal execution when the computer is running fine, but also if the system crashes. And equally importantly, if it crashes again during recovery and keeps crashing as many times as it takes it to finally come, up, come back up. So in this work, we make two contributions. One is a framework called CHL, or Crash Whore Logic, for building these kinds of formally proven correct systems for a persistent storage. And the key ideas that I'm going to describe in the rest of the talk are crash conditions and recovery semantics that allow us to precisely specify the ways in which a system could crash and automate a significant amount of proof effort while still using the underlying COC framework to mechanically check that all of our proofs are correct. I'll spend most of the talk on the CHL framework, but on top we've also built FSCQ, which is a certified crash-safe file system, the first one to be developed, and it's a fairly basic design. Uh, the design is from the 70s. It's version 6 Unix. It's not multi-core, no, no parallelism, et cetera. But the implementation is actually proven correct against a simple specification for a subset of POSIX that we've written. And the cool thing is that it actually took us about a year and a half of work, including the time for five out of the six authors to learn this COC framework and get started with formal methods. So to give you a sense of what this actually means, um, here are the two components that we wrote, CHL and FSCQ at the top of the slide. We did two things with these components. The first thing is that we ran them through the COC proof checker. So this thing checks our proofs and says, okay, you've proved that your code meets the spec, or no, go back and prove some more. And once we get the green light, we can take the code and produce an executable implementation. The way this works in COC is that 
the Cox source code gets extracted to a Haskell implementation, which will then compile with a Haskell compiler, and in our case, produce a user-level Fuse file server. And we can run this finally on Linux so that regular Unix applications like Git, Make, etc., just get their system calls transparently forwarded by the Linux kernel to our file server, which in turn does disk read and write operations on the underlying storage device. So I'll do a quick demo for you. I have a USB drive plugged into my laptop right here, and I can uh, go ahead and uh, mount the Fuse file system. And I can go over see and uh, what's going on. Well, I have a Git repo checked out here and a mail server. So I can look, there's some source code, and I can run make and it compiles. So, you know, this works pretty well. Let's not wait for this to actually compile though and uh, try to run the mail server. That's actually a more exciting application where you might hear much more about data consistency. Let me just flip to the top of the screen so all of you guys can see it. So here, I have a little Qmail-like mail server that I can run and it's gonna deliver SMTP messages to the local machine and store them on disk and make sure it doesn't lose them. So here the mail server is running and it's delivering messages to my file system, but what if the machine crashes? I'll simulate this by pulling out the USB drive. Here it is. This is what might happen if my laptop were to lose power and the whole thing, uh, you know, is crashed and I hope I didn't lose any mail. Uh, so luckily we have a proof that it's okay. We don't have any of these bugs like in the Linux EXT3 file system that might cause our data to be lost. So if I simply go ahead and uh, plug the USB drive back into my computer, and remount the Fuse file system, it will recover the contents of the file system and I can go back and see that, yeah, sure enough, I still have my Git repo with some source code, I still have the mail server, and it seems to be in an intact state. All right, so that's nice, something good happened. But you might have two questions. One is, does this always happen or did I just get lucky? And another actually more important question is, Am I looking at the right file? So for example, there's all kinds of messages in the spool representing in-flight messages that were being delivered. Do I have all the mail that I should have saved on disk at the time the computer crashed or is something missing? So to answer this question, we need a formal specification of what our file system should be providing to the applications. And you might think, well, we have this POSIX standard. It should tell us what to do. So I read this thing. Um, it's got a paragraph about crash safety. Uh, it says that um, a power failure can cause data to be lost. The data that you lose might be associated with a file that's open or one that's closed or with a directory or any other part of a file system. And it could be lost in whole or in part and the only thing you can do is carefully inspect it to make sure it's what you wanted. So this is not super encouraging for building reliable systems. Um, in POSIX's defense, their goal was to specify the common denominator behavior across a wide range of file systems. So it's not surprising they don't have a very precise spec. But still, the problem here of under specification has led to each file system implementation making its own choice of what crash safety guarantees it provides. And in turn, this has led to application developers making inconsistent assumptions about what the file system will provide and having their own crash safety bugs. So for this talk, Correct for us is gonna mean transactional or atomic semantics. We're gonna run every system call in a transaction and ensure that if a computer crashes, either the system call completes all the way or it appears as if the system call never started. The way we're gonna do this is pretty straightforward. We'll begin a transaction, do all the work of a system call and end it before returning to the user space application. And of course, the way you implement this is a fairly standard write ahead log on disk so that on a crash, you, after a crash, you run log recovery, which either rolls forward a committed transaction or rolls it back to a state before the transaction began. But the two questions we really need to answer here is how do we formally capture this notion that a program might run and it either finishes or it might crash and then you have different possible crash states? And how do we formally say that the system needs to run recovery and the recovery might also crash and yet we still need to arrive at the correct recovered state at the end of the day? So to do this, we're gonna build our CHL framework on top of a well-known idea called whore logic for writing specifications about code. In whore logic, a specification looks like the thing shown at the top of the slide. There's a precondition associated with a piece of code and a postcondition. So if the precondition holds before you run it, the post condition will hold afterwards. So for the simple operation shown in the middle of the slide of writing a sector to disk, we can write a spec saying, well, if the address being written previously used to point to an old value, that's what the arrow uh, says, it says the disk contents of that sector is that value, then afterwards, the disk will contain the new value. Simple enough. 
So to deal with crashes and to reason about crashes, we augment whore logic with an extra kind of post condition called a crash condition for us. And a crash condition describes all of the ways in which a piece of code could crash in the middle. So for this disk write operation, our specification says that you might crash with the old value on disk or maybe with the new value on disk. And this represents a standard assumption of atomic sector writes made by most file systems. And in particular, it says that we assume the disk will not corrupt the sector being written, um, and it will only be the old or the new value. You could imagine other models uh, if necessary and build other systems on top of that. But in CHL, this specification, along with the specification for disk read and disk sync, form the three axioms, namely what we assume about the disk's execution model at runtime. On top of these three axioms, we're gonna build and specify things about bigger pieces of code. So for example, let's look at a piece of code for looking up the block number from an inode. This code is a little bit interesting and complicated because it needs to deal with indirect blocks. If you're looking up block number zero or one in an inode, you can just look it up in the list of direct blocks in the inode data structure. But if you're looking up block number 50, then you probably need to go and read the indirect block from disk and index into that. So how do we prove a specification about a piece of code like this? Well, the way CHL is gonna do this is by turning the code shown on the slide into a control flow graph represented uh, on this uh, slide now. And in order to prove a specification about the function as a whole, we're gonna require that every single subroutine invoked by this code has already been proven and has a well-known specification that we can use. And the CHL framework will automate the chaining of pre and post conditions here. Namely, it will try to prove that the post condition of each block here implies the precondition of the next block, which implies that we can safely execute this whole procedure and it meets a given specification. This is all done automatically for us in the CHL framework. To reason about crashes, the CHL framework is gonna do the same thing for crash conditions. Namely, it'll try to prove that the crash condition of each subroutine here implies the crash condition of the overall function, which is what you would expect. The possible ways in which the whole function crashes is the union of all the ways in which each component might crash. So this is largely automated, and the one place where we spend a significant amount of proof effort is on representation invariance at when we switch levels of abstraction at which we're reasoning. So to explain that a little bit more, representation invariants are is this common pattern that we often use in uh, CHL and in the file system we build on top of it. So consider a function like log write, which writes to a disk block inside of a transaction. At the operational level, it just appends an entry to the log on disk sequentially. But that's probably not the level at which the application or the software on top of this layer wants to think of it. It wants to think like there's a virtual disk state or logical sort of disk that I am reading and writing from and it's just being managed by the transaction layer underneath. So to do this, we use what we call a representation invariant, the log rep thing on this slide. And here it says that in the precondition, the disk looks like a log with a particular state and then the state inside of the transaction, the old state, has some old value at the address you're writing. And similarly in the post condition, we're also now in still a valid log state, and the new state is that this address logically points to this new value that we wrote. So this is a powerful idea, and now we can actually write a specification for an almost complete system call, like creating a file in a directory. So the precondition for creating a file in a directory is that oh, we have uh, no outstanding transaction, we have a state that looks like a tree. So this dir wrap thing is a giant macro of points to relationships that I showed earlier that describes all the on-disk layout of our file system tree. And furthermore, in the precondition, we're gonna say that there, there exists some path from the root of the tree that gets us to the directory where we wanna create the file. And for the simplified create system call, we're gonna require that the file doesn't exist yet. So in the post condition, we can similarly say that, yep, well, there's no outstanding transaction anymore and we're in a new state which looks like another tree, which is pretty much like the old tree, except we updated it to stick an empty file in the place where we were trying to create a file. So this looks pretty nice. And then the one wrinkle that I'm gonna talk about now is the crash condition. And there's many ways in which you could crash during a create system call. For example, you might crash before even starting, so you just crash in the starting state. Or you might crash after you're done. So you're all done, it's the new state, everything is on disk. 
Or you might crash in the middle of the create system call where you've made some changes but not all of them. So you have an outstanding transaction in progress. Or you might crash in the middle of the log implementation itself where you've written the commit record to disk but haven't applied the log contents yet. There's a long list of states that we might be in. And this doesn't look like a specification that captures atomicity. In order to understand and write down an atomic spec, we need to reason about log recovery that will take place after a computer crashes and comes back up. So for us, the log recover procedure has a fairly simple specification. Its precondition is that we have an intact log on disk. This log intact macro is just a shorthand for all the crash conditions I showed you on the previous slide. Its post condition says that it will either roll back the state to the last state before the transaction started, or it will commit and roll forward the transaction to the latest committed state. Most importantly for log recovery, it says that the crash condition matches the precondition. This means that log recovery is idempotent and we can keep running it as many times as we want if we keep crashing during recovery. And yet we will still reach the same recovered state at the very end. Putting these two things together, the create system call and log recover allows us to state a specification about create in the presence of log recovery. So here we say, if we run create and on every single crash we run the log recovery code, then we'll have the precondition you already saw and the post condition you already saw before, but the recovery condition, which is what happens after you finally succeed in running recovery to completion, is you'll either be in the starting state or in the new state. So this is finally capturing precisely atomicity in the face of recovery on crashes. So to recap, the CHL framework that we've built has two key ideas that I've shown you, crash conditions and these recovery execution semantics. And together they allow us to precisely state and reason about failures in a piece of code. And this allows us to automatically chain these pre and post conditions which significantly reduces the proof burden for the developer. One cost of using CHL, as you saw, is that you must have precise formal specifications for every intermediate layer and function in your code, not just the top level interface which other applications might depend on. However, we find that in practice, these crash conditions at least are actually fairly simple to write above the log layer because they don't have to concern themselves with details of recovery after a crash occurs. So on top of the CHL framework, we've built a file system called FSCQ. As I mentioned before, this design is actually pretty close to a fairly run-of-the-mill file system from the 70s, except that it's got write-ahead logging for consistency, but it's missing some features like symbolic links that we haven't implemented yet. And one interesting thing about it is the implementation, which really is designed and sort of aims to reduce the proof effort required to build and prove it correct. So as an example of what we had to do, we had to really reduce, reuse uh, proven components as much as possible. So for instance, consider something as mundane as a bitmap allocator for allocating free disk blocks. In typical C code, what I would write is I would take the four kilobyte block I got from disk, chop it up into 64-bit integers, and look at every 64-bit integer using bitwise operations to see where is a zero bit indicating a free object. Turns out this is tricky to prove because we have to really carefully reason about all those bitwise operations and what's gonna happen and how do we iterate over these integers in a block. So instead, we reuse a marshalling, li marshalling library for data structures that we already wrote for packing inodes onto the disk. And we think of a bitmap as a four kilobyte block containing 32,000 one-bit elements. So we unpack the block into this giant list of 32,000 one-bit elements and then we just use a for loop to iterate over them to find a free object. We also are very careful in building up many very precise internal layers in our file system, many more than you might find in an OS textbook, for example, and they have very precise specifications that turn out to be critical to reducing the proof effort. So simple, clean specs are really helpful here. And the overall spec of the file system itself also has been simplified to some extent. For example, we don't have hard links and we think it's actually a, not a very good idea for a formally verified file system because the overall state of the file system in the absence of hard links can be thought of a very clean, simple tree. But in the presence of hard links, you have this messy graph that is hard to reason about. All right, so this is the implementation of FSCQ. How well does it work or what's going on? Is this actually a good idea? So to evaluate it, we wanted to answer three questions. First of all, what kinds of bugs have we eliminated? Is this actually useful for building reliable systems? Second, 
How much development effort did it take us, and where did we spend all this effort? And finally, how well does it perform at runtime? To answer the first question, one data point I could offer you is that, much like G, we saw that once we proved the theorems, there were no implementation bugs. That said, we did sometimes discover that we had mistakes in the specification itself. One example that we just discovered a few days ago, thanks to a bug report from uh, someone else, is that we forgot to specify that when we extended the file using the truncate system call, we didn't zero fill the new contents of the file. So we accidentally filled in some garbage there. So we changed our spec and we proved it correct and now we have a different specification that again has no implementation bugs but now we have slightly more confidence in our spec itself. Now to be a little bit more systematic, we went and looked at different kinds of bugs that showed up in Linux file systems in the past uh, number of years. So the slide shows some classes that we discovered and whether it's eliminated, whether that, that class is just eliminated by design in our file system. And the yes columns are maybe not as interesting as the cases where we think we are not fully eliminating all the possible bugs. One example is in returning error codes. So our specifications do say that if F operation fails, we will return an error. But we weren't very precise about which error to return. Maybe we'll return E in val or E perm or E again or something else. So in that case, we might have a bug which according to POSIX, we're incorrectly returning the wrong error code. Another example of a bug that we have not fully eliminated is resource handling. So we do have a proof that we will never lose track of disk blocks or share disk blocks across files, all this good stuff. But we, our specification does not require our file system to use all available space. So even if there's space available on disk, we allow the specification to return an out of space error. All right, so perhaps an interesting question is how much work does it take to prove all those properties and eliminate these bugs? Well, in terms of the gross volume, our framework CHL and FSCQ comprise about 30,000 lines of verified code and proofs. This is uh, in contrast to about uh, 3,000 lines of code of C for an unverified but almost identically designed uh, file system from the XV6 teaching OS. One cool thing is that our 30,000 lines of code, although they're large and potentially complicated, are formally verified, so we're not as worried about bugs in our implementation, even if it's larger. Another nice thing here is that over half of the lines of code and proof belong to the CHL framework that's reusable across different file systems or storage applications you might want to build. But perhaps a more interesting question is, once we have this FSCQ file system, what does it take to make a change and still prove the thing correct? So to do that, we looked at four changes that we had to make after we had an initial prototype of FSCQ. And what we see is that changes are actually fairly localized and proportional in scale and scope to the logical scope of the change we're making. So for example, supporting the disk reordering writes inside of the disk's internal write buffer required a thousand lines of code to the write ahead log, but nowhere else. Adding indirect blocks required 1500 lines of changes to the inode layer, but also nowhere else in the system. Adding a buffer cache required writing the buffer cache and a couple hundred lines of changes to the write ahead log, but otherwise very mechanical changes to pass an extra argument because we're in a functional language world. And optimizing a log layout required us to change a couple hundred lines in the write ahead log and that's it. So the cool thing here is we think this is modest incremental effort proportional to the scale of the change. This is partially due to two factors. One is the proof automation that I showed you earlier and the other is the careful structuring of internal layers in FSCQ both of which ensure that changing one piece of the code and proof doesn't require us to reprove the entire system from scratch. In terms of performance, we uh, constructed a file system intensive workload consisting of git, make, etc. We also ran the LFS file system benchmark and we ran the QMail like mail server I showed you in the demo. To provide some baseline, we compare with two other file systems. One is the XV6 file system, which has an almost identical design, but is written in C and has no proof. And another uncertified file system is the ext4 file system, widely used in Linux, but we run it in a non-default synchronous mode in order to match the strong consistency guarantees that FSCQ provides. This means mounting with dash o sync so that every system call's data is flushed to disk before the system call returns. And we ran these experiments on the SSD found in this laptop I'm using right now. So the performance results uh, first show us that FSCQ has performance comparable to XV6. The a little bit of slowdown is because of the overhead of Haskell, because we're running Haskell code and XV6 is implemented in more efficient C. Compared to ext4, 
we're a bit slower. So this is about a one and a half times slower, largely because ext4 has a more elaborate and efficient write-ahead log, which can commit a transaction in half of the number of synchronous disk writes compared to our design. This is something we'd like to fix in future work. But the really dramatic opportunity to get much more performance is to change the semantics. We are running in a synchronous mode, but being able to defer writing to disk until much later allows us to, or allows ext4 to win dramatically. So the bar on the right side of the graph that you barely see is a huge improvement over the three bars on the left. So in order to do this, we need a specification that captures what does it mean to run a system call but not have it reflected on disk right away and allow it to write back at some later point that it chooses on its own. So that's one thing we'd like to explore in future work, formalizing this notion of deferred durability. But we'd also like to look at what does it take to certify a parallel multi-core file system that can execute multiple system calls at the same time and to actually build certified applications on top of this that have end-to-end -end correctness proofs for application operations. So in conclusion, I've told you about the CHL framework we've built for certifying crash-safe systems on persistent storage, with the key ideas being these crash conditions and recovery execution semantics. And I've told you about FSCQ, the first certified crash-safe file system that achieves usable performance, especially given its design, and uh, which took us about a year and a half of effort, including learning all of the formal stuff behind it. Uh, and uh, what's exciting to us is we think there's actually many open problems here to which systems researchers can contribute and make a fundamental impact here. So our source code is available on GitHub if you wanna take a look, but otherwise, uh, thanks, and I'll be happy to take questions. Hello, Joe Tuchek, HP Labs. Um, so a lot of the bugs that these newer file systems have, especially if you, if you had the uh, leveling graph showing the slope, it's the ones that were going for performance had the most bugs, and it's because they're taking advantage of this asynchronous. Um, how much additional effort do you think it's going to be to you know, take advantage of the looseness of the POSIX spec and still write a, a specification that's uh, provable? I think uh, the, so the, the question was, uh, I guess, uh, what does it take to match ext4 finally or implement all these tricky performance optimizations? And we think it's actually quite doable. I think the big question is more, what is the formal spec rather than how much effort is it gonna take? I think given a particular spec, it's not gonna be too hard for us to prove that, well, we'll just keep this uh, file's contents in memory and flush it later. The question is how do you formalize this notion of deferring durability or what, what should happen if you have multiple writes going onto the same file or multiple renames to the same destination and all this stuff. And, and, how do you and I you think, think uh, specifying is actually a bigger challenge. We're working on it, we have some ideas, but it's really a trade-off between simplicity and succinctness in the spec versus the performance you can get. We have a simple spec, but it gets not so good performance. You might look for intermediate points, like you might say, well, we'll enforce a prefix property. If you make some changes in memory, that's okay, you can flush them later, but if you flush some change, you must flush all preceding changes. That's a spec that's not much more complicated, maybe, but the question is, is that gonna be good enough performance or not? And that's, I think, something we'll look to answer in the future work. Thanks. Hi, I'm, oh, I'm Eat Levy from Stanford. This is a real thing. Um, cool demo. Uh, I was wondering, so one of the bugs that you said you were not able to capture was allocation bugs. Um, and so I can imagine writing a specification that says if there's enough available uh, space on disk anywhere, you never return an error, but that might be hard to implement. Uh, can you imagine writing a specification that has some notion of like a threshold of space that you never return an error from or some probability that you uh, are able to allocate enough space. Yeah, so I think uh, some are easier than others. I think probabilities are very difficult to reason about because that's just a whole other ball game. But you could write a specification as well if there's you know 20% free space on disk and we have a notion of free space. Uh, we could require the file system to make progress. That's something you could write. Uh, the real question to me is what is useful to the application? Because that's ultimately the consumer of the spec. So I think you would have to look at an application and see in what cases does it really want to prove that it'll make progress and try to match a specification to, to uh, sort of what the application's uh, needs are. Bill Tatslav, IBM. Uh, obviously a crash has a wonderful cleansing effect when the file system comes back up. Have you thought about trying to partition the file system, so uh, admitting that crashes are going to happen, 
but perhaps not having to refresh the whole thing and lose all state? So what do you mean uh, lose all state? So in our case, we don't lose uh, any state uh, on disk. Well, from, from the standpoint of, of applications that are using the file system. Yeah, so we'd love to keep state on disk. So for example, in, our, in my demo, I had the mail server running, and when I crashed it and uh, it came back up, uh, most of the files were still there. And in fact, we have a proof that says all of the files will still be there on disk. Okay, but what I'm thinking of is, is more of a partial crash so that you don't have to refresh the whole thing and it might be faster. So uh, maybe one way to think of it is, uh, well, I'm not quite sure. Maybe we can chat about this offline. One uh, interesting thing to look at is potentially other models of what a crash is. So we have a very cr fail stop model. The computer just stops running, everything stops. The disk uh, sort of has atomic sector rights. So we could have a different model where maybe some sectors get corrupted or maybe well, whatever you want to model. And I think uh, the framework is going to be largely the same. We change the axioms, and then we'll just have to go from there and prove a system uh, from those assumptions. Yeah, last Ken question. Berman, uh, it's another really cool talk. Um, I, I'm actually wanted to follow up exactly on that. Have, have you given any thought to uh, what sort of the weakest hardware precondition would be to build tamper-proof disks? Because obviously, if somebody messed around with the file system while it was offline, all bets are off right now, but maybe with a little bit of hardware that you could essentially specify from your proof, uh, we, we would have a disk that couldn't be tampered with offline. So I think the more interesting question, I think a regular disk would be fine. That's probably the way to go. The thing to do is to formalize some uh, trusted chip the, or trusted uh, storage area where you can store some sort of a hash for a, or a signature of the file system. And uh, one tricky question there is how do you model uh, probabilistic operations like signing, which with very high probability are correct, but you know, as far as the logic system is concerned, there might be a collision for hash or something like that. We actually have some ideas how to model that in a way that doesn't bring in all the reasoning about probabilities and you know, two to the minus k uh, unlikely cases, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, we are sort of working, yeah, we can chat offline about Thanks. how to do this, yeah. Thanks. Congratulations Let's on thank the paper. Nikolai. Here we go here.